Welcome to the webinar, Forecasting the Future of Healthcare. My name is Terry Maxwell, and I'm delighted that you have joined us today. Uh, we've got a few more people that are signing on right now, so we're going to get started in just under one minute, and we'll be uh, joined here shortly by uh, an amazing visionary and entrepreneur, and uh, you're going to learn a lot about the front row seat that he's had to the changing healthcare landscape. So we'll just get started in about one minute. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Terry Maxwell. We're going to go ahead and get started. And um, before I kick this off, Eric, I just want to make sure, do a quick mic check. Uh, make sure your mic is working. Everything good to go? Hi, Terry. Everything seems good here. Excellent. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is Vital Signs Forecasting the Future of Healthcare. Um, we will be taking questions at the end, but feel free to type them into that question box on your control panel there. Uh, we'll be monitoring that throughout the webinar. Um, I, I want to tell you just a little bit about myself. I was invited to facilitate this webinar. Um, I've become a passionate advocate for all things healthcare right now, and particularly healthcare tech. Part of that comes from my entrepreneurial roots being in the internet. I was uh, part of one of the first internet-based educational software startups then I became president of an internet company that was later acquired by Prodigy and then AT&T. So I got a front row seat into watching how the internet really changed communications and changed business. And on a personal note, my interest in healthcare and health tech really particularly centered around connected care comes from really watching um, elder parents struggle and, uh, and, and understanding that they're not always getting the health care that they need uh, because they can't be monitored uh, in a connected way. And so I've become a real advocate for this space and very passionate on a personal level. And I'm delighted to bring to you one of the CEOs that um, really has inspired me. Um, he's got incredible entrepreneurial roots, as you'll see. He's a serial entrepreneur and inventor. And he's had a front row seat to this evolution from remote patient monitoring to connected care, and now to really consumer-driven connected care. So Eric, uh, why don't you share with us a little bit about what you see happening in healthcare and this front row seat that you've had. Well, thank you, Terry, and, and thanks all for joining in this um, event today. And Terry, I think you mentioned it well, my, my background, I'd like to Share it, I believe, brings a unique perspective to the consumerism of healthcare. And as you'd mentioned, I've uh, started a few companies and, and successfully grew and uh, exited those in uh, the first two cases, uh, and very excited where we are today in uh, digital health. If you go back in time, uh, I happen to have invented, patented the first reservation and table management system for the hospitality industry. Quite an exciting time as we were first being introduced to all things internet and uh, very early days for mobile technology. Um, ultimately, that uh, product became the front end of OpenTable.com. So uh, definitely a front row seat to uh, the internet of things and, and how that could impact uh, an industry. Uh, so that was uh, a great success, but it led to my passion for healthcare in an interesting way. Uh, that solution for the restaurant industry was designed to resolve efficiency problems uh, for the busiest restaurants in the country and, and then grew to uh, most restaurants in the country, actually. Uh, the same need was uh, necessary for healthcare, and the obvious spot to apply efficiency uh, was the emergency department. So I had co-founded a company from the original product and restaurant called ProHost to a company called MedHost. MedHost quickly became the number one emergency department solution for throughput, efficiency, order entry, ultimately physician documentation, nurse charting, integration, whole hospital communications ultimately. But it included some very consumer-centric approach to, to engaging the patient, even with kiosks when they walk into the emergency department, as well as uh, um, online sign-in for the emergency department. 
and ultimately went even further for advanced analytics and visualization because we captured so much data we could truly impact what was happening not only in the emergency department but across the whole hospital and lastly even outward with biosurveillance data across the many millions of patients of data that we had accomplished with Medhost. So uh, that was 15 years of my life uh, and uh, incredible learning experience for healthcare, focused on really understanding the needs of the hospitals. And then along came smart technology, mobile devices. Um, these devices as they were introduced to me were the catalyst for we now have the tools to do something different and engage the patients in a way that they've never been engaged before and solve this problem of overutilization of our healthcare services, which uh, everybody's focused on today. But to do so in a way, uh, we were the first seven years ago to introduce consumer electronics. Uh, before I think the term in-health was even out there, uh, we focused on this uh, quite early with the aging population as our, our first focal point, but carrying, of course, into more populations beyond that. So we, we've got this, as you said, front row seat to understanding how uh, these tools and technologies can be applied to multiple verticals. And so when you look at you know, those technologies and how they can change things, this is obvious, but you know, we all know that consumer-driven change is based upon their knowledge that they can get better and they can accomplish more through whether it's advanced technologies like smartphones that have been around a long time now, but there's many more things coming that truly can help serve the healthcare consumer. Um, and that's at all levels. You know, when we talk about a healthcare consumer today, the space of digital health is just quite large, and the majority focus on those apps and smartphones, but it really goes well beyond that. But the, the end goal of serving a consumer is uh, one where you look at efficiencies of all kinds and, and how do you apply these technologies in a way that makes sense. Uh, in you know my past passion in service industries, one good example of that is you've got a line, you've got waiting. Whenever you've got a service and a high demand for that service, like we have in healthcare, you have to find solutions for that. Just as we did in hospitality, reducing that, uh, that wait, if you will, for the service, giving them instant gratification through numerous approaches to it, whether it was remote or while in presence of that service. Uh, the same thing, we've had that need greatly for healthcare, and I really have fun with this cartoon, and I have for many years. Uh, we all dreamt at some point, you know, is there a way that we can actually apply uh, the same technologies we had in restaurants, for example, to healthcare? I chuckle at this one because, uh, you know, here's a patient saying, can we make a reservation two days before an accident? Uh, well, we actually did deliver some of those technologies for even emergency departments where you could sign in online in advance. You could sign in as soon as you walk into the emergency department and it had clinical value as well because with the kiosk as an example, we're able to identify patients before they even saw a nurse that needed to be put to the front of that queue. Uh, and so these technologies were transformative and then the rich data that's collected with every interaction from clinical documentation to order entry led to again analytics and even updating billboards on how long the wait was before you could get into that emergency department. That was true consumerism in traditional healthcare, that acute setting focused on emergency departments. Uh, fantastic experience again that's led to um, what we accomplished today. So Eric, if I heard you correctly, the future of healthcare isn't necessarily being driven by technology. It's really being driven by consumers' preferences for convenience as well as quality, and technology is just really meeting consumer preferences. Um, is, is that correct? And then second, is that the reason why we're moving to more patient-centered outcomes? It is. So convenience is, is a key here. Uh, reducing costs is a key. Uh, and so how do you accomplish all of that with technology? Um, but there's such a variety of technology solutions out there today that is, uh, you know, maybe associated with the condition that you have or the goals that you have, but also uh, could be tailored to the technology capabilities of that consumer. For example, an elderly that's not familiar with a smartphone, how do you solve that challenge? And so, um, you know, it, it is driven by consumer demand and what technologies they may be comfortable with. And that's the complexity of where we're at today. 
And I think a good example of that is, you know, Fitbit and other devices like this are uh, beautiful solutions for those that want to improve slightly on their health, lose some weight, uh, but they're generally the healthy consumer um, and beautiful solutions for that. But when we look at our true issues today in healthcare, it's driven by that unhealthy consumer. And uh, these are the, the folks that really need the attention um, and tools necessary to uh, accomplish improvements in their condition over time. Um, and uh, anything that we can uh, apply that would make the job of the provider more efficient because we have an increasingly aging population and not enough resources and providers to deliver on this. And that's a critical factor when we're looking at solutions for healthcare. It's that costly, elderly, expensive patient that should be the first point of our focus. And so if I'm hearing you correctly, and I think this is a critical point, the real cost of healthcare isn't the care for patients. It's really the care for patients whose unhealthy behaviors or aging related issues are causing the cost to be out of whack. Is that accurate? Yes, we actually need to cover all of them, but clearly the starting point is with that population that's aging and, and not familiar with uh, the current state of technology. And Terry, I'd like to, I think, take us back in time and talk about the economics that are driving some of these changes as well. So we've got this, uh, as many have said, the perfect storm of the consumer demand, the um, the ability of the technologies to accomplish a change, as well as the financial drivers uh, driven by CMS and others to accomplish this. So the quadruple aim certainly comes to mind there. Um, but that is all new, and if we look historically, uh, how things have changed over time, you know, historically we had a doctor and perhaps a specialist that were working with a patient, even doing home visits back in the day. I'm sure all the providers, hopefully there's a few on the line, recall those, those fun times. Then we moved into managed care, and with managed care, it was an attempt to have somebody else manage the reimbursement process and um, payer process, as well as to try to take some initial steps into a form of coordination. Uh, then we grew into things like Medicare Advantage uh, and these payer organizations that attempted wellness programs and call centers and outreach that were two decades of uh, failed approaches to shaping behaviors of these patients. And during all this, you know, there's more and more demand on the provider to document everything uh, by the book as needed. We'll come back to that topic. And we move today into value-based care models where we have an opportunity to coordinate care with the advancement of technology in a different way and to have outreach by the provider and put that provider back in a key role and the specialist back in a key role and not so much on that payer model, uh, but truly have solutions here where the payers, providers can all work together to accomplish that outcome that is ultimately patient-centered. So on that note, if we look past this, this changing economic over time, where we originally had provider-centered, um, we got stuck in the quandary of transaction-centered for a while, which was driven by the necessity of the EMRs, the clinical documentation, the billing, the coding, and so forth. That will still exist, but we're going to see the majority of that automated, plus tools for care coordination in a way that are truly effective now, rather than the phone call through the wellness and engagement um, services of past. So we'll see um, very soon here, and it's actually happening today, true care coordination applying uh, connected care technologies uh, in a way that is absolutely impacting everybody involved from the patient to the providers. So key driving forces behind this, certainly one of them is the incentive of reimbursement. Uh, this is actually, in my opinion, been a long time coming, but now it's happening very, very quickly. CMS, as we all know, has applied various um, alternative payment methods, and one of those certainly has been things like BPCI uh, as the, one of the initial bundles, and more recently, comprehensive joint replacement as another bundle where they are capitated. It's a, a, a value-based model. And soon, as we've all heard, um, congestive heart failure bundle as well, coming in 2017. These are the things that are now forcing the providers to uh, take a very close look and start applying on much broader scale 
connected care technologies because they now have a mission to accomplish a reduction in the cost of care as well as the outcomes are being truly measured by that now. So as the highlighted goals here of teamwork, coordination, and population health being a focus, and to the right, the CMS facts are truly happening of their mission to accomplish 50% by 2018 of uh, those um, bundles and capitated models, and 90% linked to quality. So those quality measures and cost efficiency are now critical in changing the game. So if we look at how do we actually accomplish outcomes in this space, and going back to where the issues are today, when we look at how care is delivered today, it's very episodic. And if you look at how can we truly impact a patient or population overall, that medical care, those episodes, really are only that 10% of the overall impact we can have on a patient's health. And if you look at other things like lifestyle, behavior, social, environmental, and that incorporates, of course, their health status, even biometrics into those categories. Um, these are all critical factors that we can impact on a continual basis today with technologies. And so uh, all for this discussion, call that continual care so versus episodic care. It's a huge differentiation. And we could have never done that before without putting a nurse in a home every single day. So now by having effectively a virtual nurse, um, but done so in a very effective and efficient manner that's automated helps to accomplish a proactive preventative approach even for the sickest and most elderly of our patient population because we now have capabilities to engage them in a way that they couldn't with just a smartphone app before. And so all these accomplish um, improved health scores, outcomes overall, the quality measures that are needed, and efficiency and great cost reduction. We'll elaborate um, in a bit uh, on the episodic versus uh, continual care. So let's talk about what is continual care? How do you actually accomplish it? How do you scale it? Uh, we all know that um, I'm sure most of the uh, folks on the line here are familiar with digital health, perhaps in this industry. Uh, digital health has such a broad scale and meaning but if we go back to what were our first attempts to engage a patient remotely, um, that was remote patient monitoring was one of the initial attempts. And with that, we had re relatively clunky technologies that were difficult to maintain and deploy and even difficult for most patients to use. With the advent of consumer electronics and smartphones, we can change the experience quite a bit. We can simplify the deployment. We can use the ubiquitous um, broadband communication now available across our planet. Um, so when these devices came out, it truly was transformative for the industry. Combine that with ever advancing biometric devices and many more coming. And there are so many coming that will soon have subdermal implants that are taking your blood sugar measurement with the tap of your phone uh, to a patch that requires no battery. Uh, so these are dramatic changes that we'll have to how we measure um, our specific and current health condition. And to incorporate all these together into one cohesive platform is really how we're going to deliver healthcare in the future. So I just want to kind of isolate a couple of things here. It sounds like the what you're saying is a combination of mobile and web-based technology, which by the way transformed every other consumer industry, is now converging with this consumer-driven um, taking control of their health and wanting it more convenient. And interestingly enough, that combination, ironically, can also improve care for the critically unhealthy or those high-risk patients, as well as healthy patients that might be using a Fitbit. Is that basically it in a nutshell? It, it is. You know, and it all sounds so simple. There have been thousands of companies that have attempted it and many hundreds still shooting at it and more coming all the time. And it's really not as easy as most people think. And there are a few reasons for that. Part of it is understanding healthcare workflows, and that's both financial as well as the clinical component behind that, and how they um, all need to work together uh, with numerous IT systems in play as well. They have to have a seamless flow. Uh, but in addition to that, you have to have technologies that are just so simple that, as you said, for that elderly high-risk patient, it'll work for them. Even if they are scared to death of using a smartphone, 
Make it simple enough that to them it's a pleasant experience to get the outcomes that you need, the engagement that you need on a continual daily basis, not only for months but often for years. And so that's a critical component. All these things have to work together harmoniously. Um, and, and that, you know, I'll call a prescription for health. When you look at the, the components together, uh, the providers are overwhelmed. They're giving them more tasks is something they absolutely do not want. You see a lot of docs that are saying, I give up, I'm not getting reimbursed properly, I'm going to go into concierge care services, or I'm going to attempt uh, to participate in some value-based program because I'm just not getting compensated. And so they're seeking ways out of the drudgery that they're in now, so they're in that awkward transition. To engage them in this whole population health is critical. For everybody involved, the payers, the provider organizations, the IDNs, need to engage everybody. And, and so to accomplish that communication that is typically siloed, where you've got an EMR behind the four walls of the hospital, practice management in the doctor's office, um, care coordination um, platforms and other population health platforms, to bring all those together in a single approach, including the patient and family members, is, is critical for success in population health. So where do we start? I think talking about that high-risk patient, uh, we're all familiar with the pyramid of risk and uh, looking at the, you know, the true cost behind this, as we've repeated, the high-risk patient cost is the most, but they're the hardest to really accomplish outcomes with. That's one of the biggest challenges. However, again, this has to cover every single patient, regardless of where they're at in their life cycle, uh, as well as abilities. Uh, and regardless of who's providing the care and what business models apply. So to, to cover all of these populations is, is very important, um, and certainly as they rise up in risk. But not just that high risk, even those that are you know, perhaps hypertensive, diabetic, and so forth. Let's catch them early before we have an onset that um, starts to cost money. So how much is needed and when? So let's start to dive into some of the solutions available today that can impact uh, these populations. Again, use any example, somebody that has early onset to a particular disease that may become more um, chronic over time. You can apply different approaches, uh, whether it's simple automated interactive voice response calls to using their own consumer device, whether it's their desktop browser or even their smartphone or tablet. Uh, and having the ability to reach any one of those devices, unlimited by the operating system, so that it's not just an app that they have to download, but to truly reach out to them and have a rich experience that includes interventions all the way to virtual visits and um, much deeper, a daily uh, pathway on their plan of care that they can adhere to that may change every day, all driven by a provider, all through their smartphone or other device. And then absolutely that high-risk patient or the patient that just doesn't know how to use one of those devices with the simple out-of-the-box experience, that's critical as well. So we can catch them as they're rising in risk before they get into that situation, but also downstream. So often in healthcare today, as these technologies are being applied, it's still somewhat reactive. They'll get a patient that is post-discharge and say, okay, let's now apply technology to this patient and continual care because we, we have a purpose now, and it may be a financial-driven purpose at that point, at, at peak point. And so to have a solution that can um, reduce those readmissions significantly, and, and almost always they're over 50% reduction uh, with these technologies today, um, and to have a solution that will work out of the box for that recently discharged elderly person is critical, but to also have solutions that now, let's say, they only apply technologies like this for 90 days or six months, they have the ability to step down, and now the patient may be just comfortable enough as an elderly to use a tablet. Uh, so, so many times in this space, we've had a huge number of our patients that say, look, to, the, to their own grandson or granddaughter, I now can use a tablet of my own, and then after they step off the program, they've succeeded in their outcomes and goals. Uh, they can now have a, be given a tablet by an adult child, as an example, or a smartphone, and continue on that care and remain connected with their provider, but now at much lower cost for everybody because it's their own device and they now have to use it now. 
but also for, again, those that already have a smartphone, perfect solution for those as well, tablet or even desktop. And for everybody else, that interactive voice response fills the remaining gap. So let's look at an ecosystem of a connected health platform. What truly does that look like? We've discussed some of the different patient-facing components, which we need to drill a little bit more deeply into, but there's that central component of the connected health um, platform that is a clinical tool that is critical to uh, impacting outcomes for each and every patient that is unique. They all have different conditions, different pathways, different goals, and as their um, life changes throughout programs, we may need to adjust differently for each patient. This should be automated with algorithms and analytics that apply intelligence towards the current health status and score of a patient, uh, but also um, with oversight by providers that can, of course, have interventions and alerts that are driven by the analytics and algorithms uh, so that they can impact and intervene appropriately with those patients. So let's talk about how we might intervene and what technologies, if we do a little bit more of a deep dive on this. So traditionally, I want to bring us back to remote patient monitoring technologies. Um, you know, they were, again, clunky, had wired cables, very expensive. Uh, some The nurses often were left to maintain these technologies, and they still are today. Uh, it was never scaled to any degree. Uh, other than perhaps the VA that did so by brute force. Um, and, and so what was needed was something simpler, out-of-the-box consumer experience where it all just worked. And uh, this is now readily available. It's been on the market for seven years and quite high successes with this population of patients well over 100 in many cases and an average age uh, where typically this technology is applied in the upper 70s. The majority with no experience with consumer electronics these are working, they're working beautifully with um, uh, compliance rates on a daily basis of well over 90%. So historically, you looked at these technologies, they were often at 50% compliance, many just didn't want to use it. We're now getting compliance rates that are incredibly high, very simple, and a personalized experience where it's talking to them. Um, and if there are any technology issues, pure uh, simplicity behind remote management of these and logistics and supply chain management. So truly, if when the technology is supported remotely, remote control of the screen solves any technical problem. That way the provider doesn't have to get involved. It's simple for them. The patient doesn't have to worry about anything and it all just works. So it's a transformation of how we've applied advanced technologies to manage these consumer electronics for elderly populations and providers so it's incredibly simple. If we go to reaching a broader population, how do we reach everyone uh, and not just those where maybe we've got uh, that packaged kit that has a little bit more cost to it, but now use their own smartphones and tablets like I've mentioned or even desktop? Well, the, the same platform needs to apply. And so the, one of the challenges in the digital health industry today is there are thousands of apps. Uh, there are hundreds of devices and each most of them are specific to a particular condition or biometric measurement. And to accomplish something that works across all conditions, all measurements, um, regardless of, of what pathway you'd like to take with the patient, even use it for stratification, marketing, engagement, um, broadcast, media, advertising. All these things are possible now through one single uh, digital health platform that can accomplish uh, not only engagement and encashment of the patients, but um, the same level of remote care and impacting behaviors, shaping behaviors, and um, gathering metrics on a daily basis if needed, plus the tools to have an outreach and intervention, including virtual visits. So all that's critical. Now we can do so at very, very low cost uh, in broad scale to an entire population through bring your own device solutions. So to cover that last uh, step, we have patients that, of course, still may not have any device in their home. They may not be post-acute. Uh, there are many of these, and, and you still need to engage with them. They may have nothing but a phone. So to accomplish the same outcome, driven by the same back-end clinical customized protocols for that patient, 
or to have an outreach to them where maybe they're not compliant using the other technologies. To use interactive voice response for that really fills in the remainder of those gaps. And, and the technologies today have advancements such as you can speak to it. We've all had that experience, for example, with the airlines and banks and so forth. Why not apply that to healthcare? And But again, do it so it's not just this technology, it's all the others combined to really fill in all gaps in continual care and communications between payer and provider. What's very important though is that innovation does not stop. We have technologies that are being constantly introduced to us. They're almost being bombarded today with intelligent devices. I mentioned earlier biometric device examples. Uh, we now have so many more coming that think Internet of Things, and we recently had a blog on, on this topic. But with IoT, you have passive devices in the background that are sensing patient activities around the house, even some devices coming that will measure urinalysis right out of the toilet. Uh, so just some beautiful things that will be passive that we'll be able to bring into a singular platform. And that would include Fitbit and, and similar technology. So that API for the cloud-to-cloud -cloud integration um, is a component of this as well. But to take that a step further, and when we look at how do we impact the patient so that we um, get the outcomes that we need, we get the engagement level that we need, we have to shoehorn ourselves into their lifestyle. That lifestyle might be, unfortunately, a couch potato. Uh, watching television, and so for six years we've been demonstrating these technologies on television. Uh, they are prime time, and, and uh, it's an incredible experience to see that doctor on your 60-inch television for the first time when you've got that um, visit with your doc, but also use it as a great experience for doing the same thing that we've done on the other technologies. We've been demonstrating that for some time and some great partners with that, uh, the devices that support that. I think even more exciting, you look to the right, and uh, this is a hot component right now, the wearable space. Um, not just activity sensing, but to truly impact that patient now in the same way means that we need to touch base with them constantly and, and measure not only the biometrics, such as activity sensing, heart rate, uh, but also use features on the device for things like fall detection, immediate calling out directly off the watch without pairing to a smartphone so that an elderly can put this on without doing any setup whatsoever and it can have a voice conversation with a 911 operator or a clinician as needed uh, while doing everything else that includes the reminders, the educational content, even the biometric measurements. So activity sensing, fall detection, emergency response, all of those components, very exciting capabilities. Uh, we have uh, been uh, demonstrating this for a few years as well as many other digital health companies are certainly applying these technologies also. And what's interesting about that, Eric, is I have a close friend, a guy who used to work for me in my last company, and he's one of Samsung's top executives in charge of product strategy, and they completely agree with you on uh, mobility. Ironically, they thought the uh, wearable watch movement and wearable in general would be more of a high-end product for highly connected consumers and they're now realizing kind of this massive um, market opportunity to improve patients health with real-time monitoring and biofeedback and I know he's mentioned that they've accelerated their investment in this technology for that larger population segment and also to do well by doing good. You got it. Um, you know they're not only a huge global organization, but they have uh, healthcare capabilities um, that, that span globally, and they are very focused on bringing these devices to market that can impact uh, health outcomes. Uh, in fact, they presented our uh, technology uh, on stage at the recent Worldwide Developer Conference. Um, uh, their head of healthcare was referring to our uh, technology on stage. And so it's, it's fantastic what's happening. Uh, they're getting to the point where you can now wear them in a the shower. Uh, they're very simple to charge. They're easier to put on. The ex user experience is improved. And, this, of course, the critical software component to drive those daily behaviors uh, is, is a big piece of that as well. But the, all the pieces and parts working together harmoniously is what's critical here. And not just something for fun or for the early adopter. These are real products, real solutions that um, are absolutely impacting 
behaviors. So I, I think regardless of how we engage the patient, the consumer, um, in the right environment using something that makes sense in their lifestyle, uh, it, it probably most importantly comes back to the clinical tools. Um, if we look at uh, how we impact the patient, it has to be simple, instant on, easy, but the same for the provider. If you don't get both ends cooperating together, you've gotten nowhere with um, digital health and consumer technologies for healthcare. So the clinical tools are quite critical. And with those, uh, you're really looking at that next layer of the electronic health record where inside the four walls of a provider's organization, whether it's a hospital, a physician's office or practice, a home health agency, they all have their, call it siloed solutions, which are really important. They're so custom tailored to that particular environment and the bill that they need to capture and the coding and so forth, they're very comprehensive for that purpose. But what's missing is that layer on top that we can now have that continual care for a patient very broadly. So we, we all know the history of the personal health record, the health information exchange, the RIOs, uh, et cetera. Um, and of course, uh, care coordination, care management platforms, they're really uh, capable of, of much of these things as well. But to tie it all together in a solution that you can now drive constant behavior change by the patients as well as direct um, communications with those patients through a singular platform is really the next step and differentiator. And it needs to incorporate everything from medication management and adherence down to the medication level, cross-walking across to the EMRs so that they're coded appropriately and you've got true meds reconciliation back even behind those other systems, to the advanced visualizations and algorithms and clinical protocols that need to be applied, and to have those protocols designed in a way so that any one of the providers can create new programs, new pathways, new algorithms, because they may be the experts at a specific condition. So, you know, with what we've accomplished across the country, um, over 600 hospitals uh, under various enterprise type contracts, we have experts at everything from, of course, pediatrics to, uh, of course, the, the heart failure down to things like stroke and liver disease and um, you name it, it's, it's endless. And so having a solution in which they can create their own workflows and content that become now best practices for everybody, and in many cases, evidence-based, based upon IRB studies that uh, apply to that, this is the future of healthcare. These are the new protocols that, instead of being behind the four walls in the hospital, now drive to the patient. So best practices in how we engage those patients are uh, a critical component. Um, driven by clinicians. And so as I mentioned, to have those pathways customizable at all levels so that they change as appropriate every single day based upon what is known uh, best practice or even evidence-based in some cases. Um, we've worked closely with the American Heart Association for several years and are applying truly decades of evidence-based capabilities um, into the platform as one example. But to have the tools that the providers that have a unique skill set can now build their own and, and when appropriate, apply that back to the rest of uh, the population of providers across the country and actually globally now is huge. So th this flexibility of customization of pathways at all levels uh, that include things like patient coaching and, and uh, uh, congratulations on their success or letting them know they need to improve further, to teach back uh, based upon the educational content to assure that they truly understand it. And if not, their stage of this program should continue longer. Um, and of course, outreach uh, through video education, maybe medication specific, so that they truly understand what it is that they're taking and why they should be taking it. But only after the patient says, hey, that medication isn't working for me. The cool part about everything you see here is that all of this is possible without a caregiver being involved. So when we talk about automation, which is coming up again here in a minute, it is truly automating every step. If you could take the intelligence of all the best providers in the country on a condition-specific basis and apply that facing a patient on their smartphone, TV, um, watch, phone, all of it, this is how we reach a broad population and impact 
care over the long term. So I think one of the biggest challenges in this space is, is how do we truly scale it? So going back to the days of remote patient monitoring um, and, uh, and newer technologies that may, mainly might be just apps, uh, those apps quickly drop off in, in compliance, uh, utilization. You have to have this ecosystem. Uh, and to scale, you have to have various drivers that include the business models. But connected care, connected health, uh, certainly has uh, legs in every single healthcare consumer and all models. Um, for example, our solution has been applied in everything you can see here uh, from direct to consumer, so patients and their families are paying for it themselves, to chronic care management where the provider themselves are being reimbursed by CMS at roughly $40 a month to provide care and automate that. So there's even without direct interaction with the patient, which our platform applies, to new revenue models and streams with joint ventures between payers and providers um, and value-based models that they're all uh, associated with, whether it's an ACO or, or other program, um, to care coordination and home health agencies, of course, being involved because Everybody looks at the home health agencies as that doorway to the home. Well, they have a role as well. So putting all these together so there's collaboration, patient-centered across these different organizations and individuals, um, scale absolutely to new business models and new revenue models. And the beautiful thing about all these is it's still patient-centered and still benefits the patient. And as you can see, it requires technology to accomplish that level of scale. And, I, you know, I'm probably hammered on this one a little bit too much, but existing devices is absolutely the future. Um, very soon you're going to see these devices that you'll be able to buy off Walgreens, CVS, Walmart, everywhere else that um, will instantly pair to your phone. We see, of course, the big consumer electronics manufacturers creating some of those technologies, but to bring it all together in a singular platform is really what's critical here that has all the right clinical components. But to have that also branded so that it has the, the name of the provider, even uh, videos from the doctor that are welcoming them to the program and certainly the brand of the provider organization and customized workflows that are aligned with the goals of that provider organization, all those are critical components to success. It's, it's the provider that the patient has trust in. It's that brand that the patient has trust in, not a digital health company not, and often not the payer. And so to have that brand and those workflows carry through on any device is, is critical. And another component to scale is simplifying that process when there is technology that needs to be managed and maintained on behalf of the patient. So today that's an enormous portion of when we focus on the highest risk patients. Uh, that's a big chunk. And um, even though things have been greatly simplified in terms of patient user experience, there's still other components such as if a package or a kit is maybe in a program only for 90 days, well, how do you get that package back? How do you clean it? How do you prepare it for the next patient, et cetera? This all needs to be automated, um, even the support of that technology remotely, as I mentioned earlier. So simplifying the logistics um, as well as the monitoring services and bringing one cohesive platform to the table is the only way this is going to scale across these payer provider organizations. And, and I'll reiterate the EMR integration so that it fits seamlessly into those existing workflows so that a doctor behind their Epic or CERN or other system sees this data should a patient uh, have acute service needs at their fingertips. That is a critical component as well um, as managing the supply chain and logistics here. So I want to jump into the benefits of connected care. Um, you know, what really will we see out of applying these types of technologies? Uh, and this may get a little bit in the weeds, but I think it will truly help paint the picture of how we can accomplish a you know greater than 50% reduction in acute utilization. A, uh, in some cases, if you're wholly at risk, a 10 to 1 ROI on technologies like this. Uh, and it's because if you look at, you know, here's an example patient over time, we've got an episodic work effort where you may have an urgent care visit and admit that you're at 100% utilization doing all that you can for that patient for a period of time, some follow-up appointments and so forth. 
And if you look at that patient's health index over that period of time, you'll see it certainly wavering and leveling off at maybe not the best they could be because they've had some very strenuous events here on their body mentally and socially, financially, all of it. Um, and so this is the way healthcare is today. It's very expensive and doesn't produce the best outcomes. If we apply automated engagement and look at that a bit further, so with automated engagement, that means that it's happening behind the scenes automatically and there's somebody looking for the alerts, if you will, off of the algorithm. And then as necessary, applying interventions. Well, these are proactive interventions. You're now getting the signals, if you will, from these uh, external sources as to what's happening with the patient before they even know it, and certainly before most providers know it, you can have that intervention. And that intervention, when you're using video visits um, on demand as needed or other capabilities and changing their care plans or changing their medications, et cetera, uh, is at very low cost now. It can be done quickly, efficiently, um, algorithmically in some cases, and you've now eliminated the majority of those spikes and the overall cost, if you look at the space underneath the yellow versus what we saw in the red, is a dramatic reduction in overall cost. And I think one of the one of the unknown benefits here that's really not publicized very well is if you look at what that patient's health index might have been over time, you can see that since we caught some things early before they went into those acute settings and maybe you know had an infection, as an example, in a hospital, we can impact the overall outcome, health score behavior, and everything about a patient's consideration for managing their own health. And we see in all cases a great appreciation for the patients of having that caregiver continually with them, but behind the scenes and only truly when needed with these relatively few interventions uh, that are uh, remote. So if we look at the differentiation here, just show one last picture of this, of traditional episodic care, the spikes, the expense, and the uh, health index of that patient versus those that are in an automated approach, this is how we deliver the future of care. This is how we impact everything that's needed uh, for that population and how we reduce um, everything from readmissions, adherence, satisfaction, uh, even reduction in length of stay because the providers now have confidence that this patient is going to be cared for at home. Traditionally, in my 15 years, you know, with um, MedHost is just watching the providers with anxiety that they're letting this patient go outside the four walls, knowing good and well they're likely to come back very soon, and there's nothing they can do about it. And so this gives them the confidence to reduce that length and stay, knowing that they'll have the data at their fingertips, and uh, a smaller team is caring for them on a continual basis. And so we look at the, the benefits overall for this. What we're looking at here is truly the quadruple aim. You know, we've presented here better outcomes, lower costs, absolutely improved patient experience, and even provider experience, which is that fourth leg of, of the quadruple aim. And uh, a net effect of this is, is everything that we need to deliver the future of care. That's awesome. You know, I think what drew me um, to uh, your vision and your work was really this transition to consumer-driven and connected care and using health tech, I think the piece that I'm really starting to understand is not only can you get improved care benefit, but also completely shift the cost economics and uh, uh, provide better care at the same time. Eric, before we wrap up, there are some great questions that came in, um, and I'd like to use our remaining time to, to take those questions. The first one came in from Matt. Um, and he wants to know, how do you calculate high risk versus rising risk, knowing that high risk, high cost does not always mean um, something that's highly actionable? So what would you, what would you advise, uh, Matt, there? Absolutely a great topic. Um, you know, analytics certainly uh, can be applied here. Often there, you may have your own analytics in your organization for risk stratification that clearly identify those patients that are actionable and can impact. Uh, we certainly have those technologies as uh, both embedded and partners to bring to the table to be very proactive with that. And there's two components to how you assess risk. One is assessing risk based upon what you know today about that patient. That could be from claims data, 
which is the obvious what actually happened to the patient across multiple organizations, to that EMR data. So processing and churning through the EMR to discover how bad was that condition in that acute setting. But what we see is a critical factor for further stratification to assure that you're applying it, which is your point, to the proper patient that you can impact things with is to understand what happens to that patient outside the four walls and to apply things like BYOD for somebody that you're not sure if they're the right patient or not and ask them the questions that change over time based upon what are those social factors in the home uh, as an example. What support system do they have? Uh, and you can imagine indigent populations as well that are carrying smartphones. All those are incredible candidates and a technology that can be applied to further stratify beyond uh, again, those, those pieces that, that we know today and gather that on a daily basis and stratify on a daily basis. Excellent. Um, next up is a two-part question from Richard. Um, how many different software products do you have to implement the solution described in your presentation? And then part two of that is if you already have a care coordination software system, how could they work with Vivify's platform? So uh, what we demonstrated here is available today as one single platform where you simply, for example, know that a patient has a smartphone, therefore you apply BYOD and um, they'll respond immediately without the download of an app. If they're not responsive to that, you can automate outreach through interactive voice response or deliver a kit. And that kit can be delivered to the home next day and they turn it on and it just works. So it's all from one platform. You apply the appropriate technology based upon initial stratification and what's working or not. And so all of those components, though, do tie into the medical record. You don't want to replace the medical record. You want to augment it. <clears throat> and you want to carry it across um, you know, the different uh, service lines that may apply to that EMR as well. And if there's already a care coordination platform in place, we absolutely have uh, a few partners, more coming, uh, so I want to say several, but uh, a few and, and um, others that have care coordination today and are applying our technology to engage in outreach for the patient. We have, an, um, speaking for Vivify here now, we have an open API, over 200 page API with an open architecture for partners to participate. Partners are critical here. And that data exchange is very simple as well as HL7. The API is a fantastic approach to accomplish integration with existing care coordination. And just to confirm, because Kathleen had a similar question, the connection uh, to the EMR and how you decide what data, I think that's past the open API. But in, from an implementation standpoint, I'm assuming there's real logic in, in identifying which data to make available from the EMR into uh, the Vivify system, correct? Absolutely. Um, we do a lot of interfaces. Our last, uh, as an example, EPIC implementation was two weeks. That's um, unusually fast in this space. And we've even done API integration with uh, even the large EMRs, including EPIC. The choice of data depends upon the workflows and what you'd like to accomplish behind the EMR. The typical standard is the vital metrics and alerts coming back across. You can go further with things such as the clinical documentation exchange, um, in addition, medication reconciliation could carry across as well. That becomes a little bit more complex with cross-walking the codes behind every medica medication, but you can go as far as you'd like. And another common approach is uh, the reports that show a visual of that patient's current status over a period of time that could be you know, viewed in um, a simple report built into the EMR, whether it's PDF, uh, HTML, and so forth. So the, it's it's based upon the workflows that are determined as we go through the experience of uh, our providers working with your providers, our clinical consultants, analyzing your workflows based on our experience across the country and then determining which data points are best to exchange. Excellent. I think we have time for one more question. Um, speaking of VBRs, does uh, the Vivify platform help support CCM chronic care management, uh, which I believe is a $42 a month for a Medicare recipient with two or more chronic conditions. Yes, we have uh, purpose-built uh, enhancements to our platform. It's the exact same platform that include automated timers and reports. 
uh, that are specific to the clinical time spent reviewing patient information or outreaching to the patient. That automated report carries back into the um, practice management system as needed to drop the bill to CMS. And it truly is um, measured based upon actual clinical time spent with the patient and nothing else. So all those timers and automation reports are built right into the platform. And the beautiful thing is it can be automated. So much less work than traditional call center management for chronic care um, at uh, lower prices and even better outcomes. Excellent. Uh, thanks for taking those questions. Um, uh, Eric, this has been phenomenal. Closing comments uh, for the group. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely have a few. I, I think for those that are just jumping into, let's call it digital health, uh, it is a complete madness out there. We, we do appreciate that. And if you look at the explosion of solutions for digital health, they're driven by many things. And we've talked about a lot of them here, uh, obviously the um, financial drivers behind this, but also ubiquitous mobile technologies. All the reasons we jumped into this space seven years ago and so had the foresight of what was coming um, are now here today. It's obvious to everybody, so it's just maddening how many solutions are out there. And if you look at, I'll call it digital health, there's everything from wellness to engagement to virtual visits to monitoring. I'll read them off here, care coordination, analytics, reimbursement. It, it's messy. And so uh, you need to find a solution and platform that, that truly can deliver an umbrella to all of that, and there is no magic bullet to um, all of those capabilities. Even what we're proposing here is not a magic bullet. So you have to work with partners and collaboration across entrepreneurs, um, as we like to call simultaneous innovation. And Terry, thank you for uh, helping guide us to some of those uh, key terms. But with that, we have. Um, experts, whether they're in mobility, in data connectivity, in the future of how we're gathering information from a patient, a patient uh, through their bloodstream, to how we deliver care on a nationwide basis uh, uh, at urgent levels, and then experts across our customer base at many conditions. Uh, all these partnerships are critical. Uh, all of our investors uh, are uh, very strategic for our company. Um, and uh, most of them are provider organizations, and they have aligned with us and partnered in a way that is meaningful for creating the best possible workflows and content. And, and we have many entrepreneurial partners as well, and so working together as a team and having an API approach to integration is critical to the success of digital health. Well, Eric, thank you so much. I want to thank the audience. Um, I'll let everybody know you can reach out to uh, me and I'll make sure you get a copy of the recording. Um, you know, Eric's insight in this world of constant yet sustainable innovation uh, is going to, I believe, be the type of thing that really makes, um, puts the care back in health, if you will. Um, also want to encourage you, if you want to reach out to both me and Eric on LinkedIn, uh, we're facilitating a lot of discussions about digital health and connected care, and we would love to be connected to you if you're passionate about this. And again, Eric, um, you know, you continue to impress me. Your organization is by far one of my all-time favorites, and uh, you're quickly becoming, um, you know, uh, a, an entrepreneurial friend. And I just believe somebody who's got great insight for the industry. So I just want to thank you so much for um, doing this webinar today. Well, thank you, Terry. And I want to thank the audience for joining us today. We hope to do more of these in the future uh, as uh, new capabilities come available in this space and other um, ideas surrounding healthcare and its delivery. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Eric. Bye-bye.